Hi, um, welcome to this virtual conference talk. Um, I'm Christoph von Sommer, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Pronovix, and uh, I want to present to you a new talk that I've been working on for quite a while now, um, because there's a lot of a lot of new thinking that has gone into this. Um, uh, and for this occasion, I've titled it Beyond API Spray and Pray. Um, it's basically a lot of ideas about how to combine um, developer portals and API technology and API strategy uh, into a wider digital transformation uh, strategy. And uh, what does that mean exactly for API uh, developer portal uh, architecture? Um, if you've ever been to one of my talks, then probably you've seen me talk about this thing before, uh, that uh, developer portals need to be more than reference docs. Um, also, you probably saw me talking about dev portals as self-service hubs. And you've also heard me talk about um, developer portals as a trust signal. Um, now, I think all of these things obviously still stand. And I think that as an industry, as a developer portal industry, um, we've, we've made good progress towards um, making these things more important. Uh, I see very few just API reference docs and dev portals out there anymore. Uh, I think there's been, there's been a good shift. People have started recognizing that business personas play a role in developer portals. What I want to talk about is like what, what's, what's like the next thing? Like how do we go beyond like the basic infrastructure and how do we really make developer portals part of a strategic effort. Um, because <clears throat> I think there's this thing that I started, this pattern that I've started seeing emerging. It's like, it's connected with, I think, uh, some uncertainty about um, good working API strategies and um, some uncertainty around clear visions for, for developer portals um, and how they fulfill their role within an API program. It's, uh, it's this thing that spray and pray does not work. I was looking for a picture. I didn't want to take one with the um, machine gun because it's just too violent. Uh, arrows can be very violent, but you know <laughs> we are a little bit further removed from them. So, um, but um, so what I was looking for, spray and pray, what I've seen with some organizations, um, some of them are customers is that they don't really know yet what their API program is going to mean for them strategically. Um, they're, they have, they've maybe had a, a first real killer API that was really a big success um, that got them the, the C-level buy-in that they needed to continue with the program. Um, they've maybe have some, some initial product that they're selling or something like that, uh, or maybe some initial savings that they're doing. Um, but like the overall strategy, like what is it really that we're trying to do here with APIs? Um, like there's a lot of ideas, but it often it's not really crystallized out. And like there's there's general ideas, but I think that every company needs to think about their specific circumstances and create their own API strategy, and that that API strategy needs to be reflected in their developer portal. And that's what I mean that spray and pray does not work. Um, if you just take, uh, if you just get everybody to create APIs and just dump a truckload of APIs into your developer portal and then just like, ta da, we're done. Uh, no, <laughs> you're not done. Um, just like having just the reference docs up your, uh, in your portal is not enough. I think it's not enough to have business documentation for individual APIs separately. But I think what you need is an overarching um, architecture that bundles together uh, APIs uh, into a couple of things. And, and this, what I've been trying to do in this talk is talk about a couple of archetypes. And they're, um, yeah, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. So because a developer portal, this was something, this was also a slide that I, I always put in, but it was not, never really explained what I actually meant with it. A developer portal, as far as I can see, um, can be this crucial infrastructure, like the, uh, the interface to your interfaces that helps you uh, to um, organize and direct, to some extent, your digital transformation. And like I know digital transformation is a very woo-woo word. Um, uh, it's, a, 
it's overused and and um, often the promise is bigger than than the results uh, i think in a lot of cases um, but i don't think that that's necessarily a problem uh, because of what, what's underlying digital transformation i think it's um, a problem of uh, really localizing your API strategy and uh, your documentation strategy and how that all fits together to create, you know, to, to really transform your organization. Just implementing technologies is not going to help with that. Um, technology is just a tool. It's, um, you know, you can have the best API platform, you can have the best developer portal. Um, if there's no clear strategy, if you're not um, working and developing your strategy in parallel with uh, with with those technologies, then uh, these technologies will be useless. Um, their, their their value will be very very small. I've done this talk or an early incarnation of this talk at a meetup in Frankfurt that was organized by Olaf from Daimler and Matthias from Deutsche Bank, and I was talking there about the different types of developer portals. And after after that um, presentation, like uh, just last week, um, Matthias Wischer uh, came back and was like, Christoph. Well, I've been thinking a lot about this, and what, what I came up with is that the developer portal needs to be like a toolbox. And just like in toolboxes, you have these compartments that hold certain types of tools together um, that you can like take out of your box. And um, just like that, the dev portal needs to be where you have like different compartments for different parts, for different types of tools that are organized together, creating like a hierarchical structure for your uh, APIs. And I think that's a really good analogy. Uh, and I asked him and he said, it's okay to steal it. So here <laughs> you go, Matthias. Um, I love that analogy because I think uh, you just making a flat developer portal and treating all your APIs like the same, on the same level, um, does not give you the rich developer journeys that you need to be really successful, I think. But before I, I, I dive into the dev portal types, um, I'll talk a little bit about digital transformation um, because I think digital transformation is this buzzword that carries a lot of different flags. And I did I, I, I asked this question at an event in December uh, from from a local networking uh, community, and um, I asked them like, "What does digital transformation mean for you?" And it was fascinating the the, the different answers that you get. Uh, for some people, paperless documents are digital transformation. Uh, some others are CRMs, uh, Agile, AI, DevOps. There's like all these different things that are being seen as digital transformation. And like, but when I look at them uh, all together, most of them are about methodologies or technologies that organizations are implementing as a sort of best practice that they hope uh, that it will help them to become something different. And uh, while it's true that best practices and technologies can be great uh, constraints to help you to create new behavior, I think that the real digital transformation is about a transformation of businesses and how they work. Uh, and, and what does that mean for, for how the business will, will develop and grow uh, over the long run? I think that APIs play a, a crucial core aspect uh, in that. Um, and I'll explain later why. But it's. Um, yeah, I think the, the key is that it's about the transformation of your business. It's not about implementing technologies. Uh, because I think that digital transformation um, is a response to two macroeconomic shifts. Um, actually, in times of Corona, this is potentially even more relevant. Uh, we've seen all how the ability to quickly adapt to, to circumstances, like um, my sister, she, um, She's married to the cook of a, of a local restaurant. They were one of the first to start offering takeaway food. Like the same weekends that Belgium closed down, they were offering takeaway food. And they were able to do that because they already had in place some digital technology for uh, reservations and for, for taking orders. And um, that company that had implemented that offered them uh, the ability to digitally order and, and do takeaways in a safe way. And um, funny thing is that uh, my sister, she told me that their company, their, their restaurant was in the region, the, the most successful company selling takeaway food, which is really interesting. Um, but what I mean is that we are in this turbulent times and today that's even more uh, relevant than a couple of months ago. 
um, we are in this hyper turbulent times where a lot of things are changing. And I think a big part, this is caused by globalization and by interconnection. And, uh, and I'm not saying that globalization is bad. I think um, if, we, if we are more deliberate about it, this can actually be really good for us. Um, it's just that so far we've mostly been reacting to these changes in the networks around us. So we are from Promovix, we're a dev portal company. We partner with Apity, uh, that's part of Google. Uh, we've got a lot of experience building developer portals. Um, we even helped uh, Google Cloud build their new integration for their, dev, uh, for their API management solution uh, with, with Drupal. Uh, we've won awards with our dev portals. Uh, like um, uh, we've actually started awards. We organize events like this one. And um, yeah, it, if you're already here, then probably you've seen some of this already. This was uh, last year's conference. Uh, normally, we're going to have our next one in Portland, but you know, since you're here, you know that we're we're doing this digital now. Uh, we do also a lot of research, so if you're not yet part of our newsletter, uh, where we're publishing our research, uh, go and go and check that out. So there's two macroeconomic shifts. I think the first one is <clears throat> that we are replacing physical proximity with digital proximity. Like I, I used to have a slide where I talked about physical proximity to developer to, to digital experience and, and developer experience, but um, uh, digital proximity is a is a, a term that uh, I heard Matthias Biel uh, from uh, UBS and API University mention the first time uh, when I had a conversation with him in Switzerland. Um, what what I mean with this is that we used to business used to be about being close to your customer so that you could facilitate uh, a financial transaction or like a, a value transaction. Being close was, was mostly a physical thing. You needed salespeople, you need someone who, who would be in the same room together with the customer, um, who would be able to go there, um, do a sales call. Uh, you know, you, you needed to be physically be very close and, and spread throughout the world to be able to sell whatever you were selling. Um, now, what we've been seeing in the last couple of years, and I'm sure that Corona is accelerating this now, is that, uh, like for example, banks, they started closing their um, uh, physical offices. Uh, more and more branch offices got closed down. Um, there was a lot, a lot of mergers happening between branch offices. And you started seeing that um, physical presence in all the different uh, localities was was becoming less and less important and instead uh, there was a shift towards uh, mobile presence this push towards um, interactions through digital technology and this obviously is being created uh, because of uh, digital technology uh, that this has become possible and has become expected and has become uh, a key driver for change uh, in the market in a, in a bunch of different markets and corona makes it makes, makes it stronger so and, and what you can see that to be able to deliver digital proximity, you need um, integ integrated customer experiences. You need digital interfaces to allow for uh, these interactions, but you also need to be able to um, put your product uh, inside of somebody else's product. Um, so you know, beyond having digital interfaces, you also need to think about how uh, you're going to enable the experience that you can't deliver yourself and how you're going to be part of somebody else's um, experiences. And uh, APIs play a key role in this, uh, and a developer experience plays a key role in facilitating uh, the, usage of, the usage of API and implementation of um, these interfaces. Um, developer marketing, making sure that people know that you're providing uh, the, the part of the puzzle that they're looking for, is also uh, a key component. All these things play an important role in delivering uh, digital proximity. The second big market shift, and I think this is the, it's obvious once you start thinking about it, but it's less above the water, is a shift in complexity. Uh, we're going from a world that was seemingly static, just like a glacier. Like it's moving, but so slow that you can pretend that it's static and you can just walk on it to this unmistakably dynamic uh, environment where in a very short time, especially now with Corona, we've made this, like it's, it's like a, a phase shift. We've gone from solid to liquid or from liquid to you know, gas, but there's this flip over 
now we live in a world that's much more dynamic, where you cannot make assumptions about the markets. You can't uh, expect the markets to may, remain the same. Personally, I really love the Cinefin framework to think about this because uh, Cinefin framework is um, a problem uh, solving framework. And it helps you to think about problems uh, as different types of problems. Uh, so you have obvious problems, and those are very easy. It's like um, it's a mountaintop. Uh, it's like a Mount um, a Mount Vesuvius or something. There's one top, and you just keep going up. And once you're at the maximum, you're at the maximum. Nothing changes um, unless the volcano explodes. But um, normally, you know, it's it's a, a fairly stable situation. And you can very easily optimize um, uh, your answer to uh, an obvious problem. Com complicated problems, on the other hand, have a rugged landscape, value landscape, where uh, you have lots of little small mountains, and uh, you might be going to a local optimum and then get to the top and realize that there's a higher um, a hill a little bit further. And when you get to the top there, there's another one. And you keep, like, you if you are an expert, if you know the landscape really well, um, then you can easily go to the optimum, but uh, it's a little bit harder to figure out where that optimum is exactly. Complex problems are very different. They're completely different. They're um, basically dancing landscapes. And uh, complex problems, uh, any change you make as a participant in the market, uh, the whole market changes and everybody else needs to change their game. Anytime anybody else changes their game, you have to also go and change your strategy. And in a complex world, you can no longer um, you can no longer use experts because you you can have some best practices and some ideas about good things to try, but you cannot be sure that whatever you're going to try is actually going to work out because maybe by the time you implement it, everything has changed again, and now you're in a different landscape. Uh, and then chaotic, where there's no constraints at all, everything is decoupled. Um, in a chaotic situation, you need to try to get out of it. And then somewhere in between is disorder. Right now, yeah, probably we're in a, a disorder state, I think, possibly between, uh, like, you know, the landscape has just liquefied and everything is shifting. Um, but um, yeah, but what, what I think has happened because of digital technology is that we're evolving from a complicated landscape where you could make business plans for years to a complex landscape where your business plans have to be adapted um, all the time. The best way to adapt to complex um, systems or to, to complex environments is to be a complex adaptive emergent uh, system uh, and to, <clears throat> uh, to collaborate with uh, a set of peers that are learning together and that are evolving together. Uh, and, and we see this in nature. Uh, you see beehives, ecosystems. Uh, they're all complex systems that are uh, very adaptive, where it doesn't matter if any single one dies, uh, the, the whole tribe uh, survives. Now, I believe that developer portals can be an interface to help you tune for complexity. I'm not going to go too deep into the parameters of complexity based on um, a research that I've, like complexity research that I've read. But um, interconnection and interdependence uh, are, are things that you could tune for uh, and that you could um, use a dev portal for to, to improve them uh, so that you become more adaptive. So, but then the dev portal types, um, the, the part that we've, I think you've been waiting for. What does all mean for different types of dev portals? Or, you know, when we go back to the toolbox, sub boxes that hold different APIs that might be part of a bigger toolbox, a bigger dev portal that uh, holds different types of these things. I think the first one is uh, ecosystem dev portals. And ecosystem dev portals are um, dev portals that are built to support an ecosystem um, where there's not necessarily very strict control. Um, an example of this are internal developer portals. This is a screenshot from a presentation that uh, Darren Shelchucky did uh, at our Chicago conference um, for Fort Motors, uh, where he talked about his, their internal developer portal and how they're using that internally to, to expose APIs and to, um, you know, to facilitate 
uh, API usage in the ecosystem. So the, the idea there is that an ecosystem dev portal is there to increase resilience and, and, and adaptivity, where you're not necessarily trying to predict what, uh, what should be there exactly, but where you're giving place for uh, new interconnections to, um, to spring up and where you're facilitating uh, in, interdependence and interconnection through, through a portal interface so that all of your organization can become more resilient and adaptive. Second one is platform developer portals. Uh, platform developer portals, a very good examples are uh, Nexmo and Stripe. Um, they're uh, very focused platforms that enable something difficult. They're um, uh, centralized, uh, like the uh, ecosystem dev portals are decentralized, platform dev portals are centralized. Um, they're openly constrained, so the, um, the, the APIs on a, a platform dev portal can be recombined to do sur very surprising things. They're built in such a way that they enable a certain functionality that might not have been there before. The third is apps or integration developer portals. Um, these are dev portals where um, you have highly constrained uh, uh, affordances that are only um, allowing a specific type of interaction, but that do it in such a way that you don't need to you don't need to develop too much. It's it's like you just turn it on and you you have a new uh, capability um, available to to an individual or to an organization. Um, apps and integration app portals are typically about creating whole product strategies or um, like having certain capabilities that need to be available out of the box for very non-technical people that. Um, you know, that allow them to do technical outcomes without uh, coding, uh, without having to involve a developer. Um, like the example that I showed you earlier with uh, integrations is a good example. But another example could be um, what I heard Ken Lane talk about, uh, what he saw at one of um, uh, Postman's uh, customers, where um, financial analysts were using Postman collections that were defined, like that were created by developers upfront to get information out of uh, out of APIs that they could use to build their reports. So, like having a set of predefined um, applications that enable a technical outcome uh, without having to do code. And then um, digital marketplaces. I think we need to be very careful with digital marketplaces because. For me, a digital marketplace is are, are things like Uber and Airbnb that are um, two-sided marketplaces where you're bringing consumers and producers together, but they're highly constrained and uh, they're focused around transactions and not around infrastructure. So APIs are pipes, they're infrastructure with which you build a connection that then is used to do transactions. And digital marketplaces are actually tools for transactions. They're so constrained that there's very little space for innovation left um, uh, with those affordances that are being offered. Like you can't take Airbnb's interface and use it for something completely different, or it's very, very hard to do that. Um, and I think that that's why I think that a, a digital marketplace is not really a developer portal. So this idea of an API marketplace which I think is often the precursor for this pray and pray strategy. Like, you know, we're just going to build a marketplace and put a whole bunch of APIs on there, and then people are going to use them and pay for them, and we're going to make money. I think that's a very dangerous one because um, it doesn't have the strategic, um, it doesn't require you to become strategic and to really think about what APIs fit together. Uh, how like these different levels of, of constraintness, these different types of affordances uh, and the different types of audiences that you need to address with these different types of affordances. Because um, someone who's not a developer needs different journeys than someone who is a developer. So if, if a, a non-developer needs to be able to use an affordance, uh, that affordance needs to be very, very differently. That, that journey is very different. Um, I do think that market edge developer portals where um, you're like, like there could be a precursor for a more advanced strategy, but like an, an edge where you're monetizing APIs could potentially work 
um, like I heard this example from uh, a company that is doing um, insurance APIs. They were like an aggregator for insurance APIs in the German market. Um, there, so, something like that, I, I think can work. Um, potentially, this is like a, a initial step towards becoming an aggregator, uh, where you create one API that um, gives access to all the, the information and the functionality from, from the multiple uh, different APIs uh, from your ecosystem. But I, I think that could work. And then you need to think about regular, uh, regulatory proximity and uh, problem space proximity. How can you be differentiated enough that people start recognizing you as a place to go to get a certain type of API? I don't believe in, um, you know, well, a rapid API, maybe that does work. I think, I, I think in Japan, uh, it, it might be working, but I'm very, I'm, I'm skeptical. I don't think that we need a phone book for APIs. Um, I think we need, uh, I, I don't think we need a, a market, like a marketplace for APIs. I think we need a shopping mall with boutique shops uh, and, and boutique, boutique interfaces and people that help you to have good experiences uh, and that are learning about what makes great experiences. And the last one is uh, procurement developer portals where, um, yeah, I, I needed to, I was, I, I didn't find it. Um, I, I wanted to replace this with a screenshot from um, BAM's. Uh, Deutsche Bahn has a procurement dev portal, I learned in Frankfurt, but I haven't been able to get a screenshot from them. So this is another Airbnb screenshot, so we disregard the screenshot. And uh, procurement dev portals um, help you to optimize for resilience by um, maybe having multiple vendors that you automate interactions with where you could switch between vendors if uh, something happens with one of the vendors or if there's a price uh, shock or something like that. Um, potentially also, there might be a role for autonomous APIs in procurement uh, dev portals. So, well, what does this all mean? What are we really building? I think what we are really building is what um, Matthias from the beginning of the talk uh, uh, proposed, this toolbox with lots of smaller toolboxes that go inside of it um, that you can uh, that you can like take out and like and focus on a specific type of task. And there's another platform for another type of task where different APIs are, are together and where you've created developer experiences, maybe through an SDK that combines different APIs that really makes sense and makes it really easy to achieve uh, technical outcomes uh, in an easier way. Uh, and I think that probably what we're, we're all building is some sort of internal ecosystem, especially if you're a large company that is supporting um, maybe a platform on top of which there's again an external ecosystem, maybe with a couple of apps um, that make it easier to do things. Maybe you have um, uh, an apps marketplace internally uh, to allow uh, your um, you know, cer certain things that, that are normally technical uh, to be done without coding and th things like that. So you get this amalgam, this um, hybrid solution where you, you combine different solutions into uh, a single portal. And, um, and this is, these are the last three slides. I think if you're interested in this stuff, uh, the reason why I think APIs are a core to a digital transformation is that they are signal boundary systems. What I mean with that is that you can use an API to create a boundary around the team and then to create an interface that is um, conservative, um, but that allows what is inside of the boundary to evolve rapidly uh, to whatever signals are coming into the system. Um, so APIs allow you to break free from the silo constraints and uh, to improve adaptivity through faster information cascades. Like these smaller teams can more quickly learn from what's going on outside. Um, I, I think the other, the other overarching principle, I think, is that we need to use complexity deliberately. Right now, I think there's been a shift from seeing complexity as something bad. I think it's complicatedness that is bad. I think that we have to carefully engineer our organizations so that they can be complex adaptive in certain places and very constrained in other places. And that by alternating layers of high and low constraints in systems, we can maximize both adaptivity and efficiency. And then the last one is that uh, Conway's law that your organization will design a system that um, 
uh, mirrors the structure, the communication structure of the organization, but also the other way around, uh, at least they call this reverse Conway, um, that if you're reshaping the structure of your organization communication system, you can also use it to change the structure of your organization. And ultimately, I think what we're going towards is um, this kind of stigmergic behavior where individuals, um, the individual behavior is enabled uh, to be like individuals are enabled to act independently, um, but the combined individual behaviors create a super behavior as an organization that is highly adaptive that can adjust to a change in the environment. Like for example, with ants, where um, the pheromone trail that ants put down once they found food helps ants to amplify pathways to new food sources and to build down pathways to food sources that have been exhausted. Um, and to adapt to their environment. And I think it's something very similar that what, we, what we're trying to do with digital transformation and with APIs. And uh, that's all. Um, thank you for joining and for listening to me. If you're interested in our um, blog post, this is our uh, link to our newsletter, uh, but we'll share that later. There's a bunch of books in the slides um, that you could go and check out. Um, with, uh, with also the links to the pictures. Um, yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll share this uh, after, after the conference. Thank you very much.